Greetings, greetings, everybody. This is going to be part 23 of the Judas series. Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries, John 8, 12. You know the deal. In the book, this is page 284, chapter 6, in uh, part 3, part 3, chapter 6, and the title of this chapter is A Few More Identities. So let's, uh, let's get to reading. In Ezekiel's riddle concerning the kingdom of Israel, which is in the northwest isles of the sea, that fruitful land by the great waters, to which these two ships of Dan carried their royal passengers, we are told that the kingdom became a green tree after the royal pair were united and placed on the throne in the height of Israel, and that it became a goodly cedar. Of that tree it is said, Under it shall dwell all fowl of every wing in the shadow of the branches thereof shall they dwell all understand of course that the prophecies of this riddle is given in veiled language mostly metaphor but we know of no prophecies in all the word of god that have been any more perfectly fulfilled than those of this riddle and we affirm that there can be found no race on the face of the earth in which the conditions are given in the above are so completely fulfilled as in the Anglo-Saxon race, first in England and her colonies and then in America. A fowl of every wing, i.e. people of every nation, all dwelling under the royal cedar, whose scions come from Lebanon, Palestine territory, or under the extended shadow of its branches. That is directly under the central power or under the dominion of one of its protectorates, or else under the protection of the separated brother of the house of Joseph, i.e. Manasseh, the brother of Ephraim, or America, England's brother nation. The fact that these two nations have with them in their home country so many people of other nation, uh, nationalities has been used as an argument to prove that it is not possible for the Anglo-Saxons to be the lost house of Israel. But the very fact that this is so and that men of other nations can come among us take out their naturalization papers, become citizens, and have equal rights with those who are home-born, has on its very face the proof that we are Israel. For the Lord gave commandment unto Israel, saying, When a stranger shall sojourn with thee, he shall be as one that is born in the land. One law shall be to him that is home-born and unto the stranger that is sojourning among you. And that's in Exodus 13, 48 through 49. The political conditions mentioned above do obtain in Anglo-Saxon countries and in no other countries of the world. The reason given for the establishment of the law that permitted stranger to become his home-born citizens in Israel is that they were strangers in the land of Egypt as before them. Abraham, their father, was a stranger in the land of promise. The fact that this law prevailed in Israel and that it is the law in all Anglo-Saxon commonwealths shows that they are one and the same people and accounts for the following state of affairs in Ephraim, which we must remember is the representative name of the house of Joseph. 
We read the following in the scriptures. Ephraim, he hath mixed himself among the people. Strangers have devoured his strength, and he knoweth it not. That's in Hosea chapter 7, 8, and 9. Foreign labor, anarchy, and Romanism. In both England and America, many of these strangers are naturalized and become as home-born, only that they may secure official authority, power, and prestige in their affairs of state, so as to help the non-citizen foreign hordes to devour the strength of their government, and yet apparently they know it not. Bob's note here, boy. Listen to this, what was going on 100 years ago. Citizen foreign hordes to devour the strength of their government, and yet apparently they, the citizens, know it not. Surely these identities, as given above, are some of the waymarks that the Lord commanded if Ephraim Israel to set up. Jeremiah 30 and 23 21 but there are yet others we have made it clear that the t-u-a-t-h-a d-e d-a-n-a-a-n-s of northern ireland were those of the tribe of dan who belonged to the seacoast colony or at least that part who abode in their ships and thus escaped but where Dan is, there Israel must be also, for Dan was a part of Israel and was to judge, or Dan, his people, as one of the tribes of Israel. It is a well-authenticated fact of history that the Milesians, M-I-L-E-S-I-A-N-S, -E or Scots, inhabited the north of Ireland as well as the tribe of Dan that they were the same race of people, and that the word Scots means wanderers. Professor Totten says, Scythiopolis has been traced to S-I-K-Y-T-O-P-O-L-O-S, a city of Sikoth, S-I-C-C-U-T-H, a corruption of Sukoth, S-U-C-C-O-T-H or S-C-O-T-H-O-T-T-I the city of the Scots Siths Sacks or Wanderers i.e. dwellers in booths or tents. When Ephraim was cast out Hosea declared they shall be wanderers among the nations. And this is in harmony with Amos, who says that they should be sifted through the nations as corn is sifted through a sieve, and yet not one grain or stone was to fall to the ground. Hence, they were to wander through the nations until they reached the isles of the sea that God appointed place for his people where their enemies should not waste them and where they should renew their strength. But where Israel and Dan are, there too must the Canaanite be. And it is a well-known fact that the settlers of Southern Ireland are a vastly different people from those of Northern Ireland, and that the difference is in the origins from which they sprang from a different race. Moses said to Israel, But if ye will not drive out the inhabitants of the land before you, then it shall come to pass that those which ye let remain of them shall be pricks in your eyes and thorns in your sides and shall vex you in the land wherein ye dwell. Numbers 33 and 55. 
The Lord also said, If ye do not in any wise go back and cleave unto the remnant of those nations, even those that remain among you, and shall make marriages with them, and go in unto them, and they to you, know for a certainty that the Lord your God will no more drive out any of these nations from before you, but they shall be snares and traps unto you. Joshua 3, 12 and 13. The Philistines most certainly did become a snare to the tribe of Dan, for they were the first tribe of Israel to fraternize with them and the first who joined with them in the worship of their god, Baal. Simeon soon joined with them, and so eventually did both Israel and Judah. The evolution of the name of this Canaanitish nation, the Canaanite nation, is from Philistine to Phoenician, then Phoenician, then Venetian, and then F-E-N-I-A-N. The F-E-N-I-A-N-S of Ireland boast of their Phoenician origin, had the 16-letter alphabet and many evidences to justify their claim. These people lived with Dan and Simeon in Palestine and came with them to Ireland. They are still hewers of wood and drawers of water, and certainly thorns in the sides and pricks in the eyes, only of England and America. This is the vexing Irish question. For these are the nations which the Lord left to prove Israel by them. Judges 3, verse 1. The physiognomy of Israel must be different from that of the Jews. We must remember that although Benjamin was with the kingdom of Judah, they were the children of Rachel, and that they differed much from the characteristic Jew, both in looks and in speech. The Galileans were Benjamites. Hence all the apostles of Christ, except Judas, were Benjamites, for they were Galileans. And while Christ was in the kingdom, uh, uh, while Christ was in the judgment hall, some of those who stood by said to Peter, Surely thou art one of them. All right, so some of them who stood by, uh, you know, Christ was in the judgment hall. And some of those who stood by said to Peter, Surely thou art one of them, for thy speech betrayeth thee. He had a Galilean accent. You ever heard somebody from England? They have the English accent. Germany, German accent. New Yorkers, compared to somebody from the South. I mean, you know, they speak a certain way. So they sounded like Galileans. So when Peter's saying, I don't know this guy, well, you're, you sound like a Galilean and Jesus, of, you know, Jesus, the Galilean, you know, he was from Galilee. So also Esther, that lovely daughter of the captive people and Mordecai, that Jew of the Jews could pass in and out of the palace of A-H-A-S-U-E-R-U-S and not betray the fact that they were of Abrahamic blood because they were Benjamites. And that's in Esther chapter 2, 5 through 10 and through 20. Uh, Bob's note here. If uh, an angel came to me and told me and said, Hey, Bob, uh, there's one book in the Bible that does not belong. Can you guess which one it is? My guess would be Esther. Uh, but I'm not going to tell you it doesn't belong in the Bible because I'm not sure. And there's a big curse for people that would remove the words of the Lord from the Bible. And that's in... Revelation. So, 
I read uh, I read Ezra, uh, Esther one time and probably listened to it once or twice, but that's it. You know, I see very little value in the book of Esther, but that's just my personal opinion. If these differences were noticeable in the case of those tribes, which differences lay in the fact that they were only half brothers, how much more so would they be in the case of the house of Joseph, who were still further removed from Judah, and that they were ha half Egyptian? No, they weren't. Sorry, they weren't Egyptian. Uh, I mentioned this in a previous study. Um, Joseph married a woman who was a daughter of the, of the priest. I think it was Potiphar. I'm not sure. Um, but uh, according to this time in history, the, um, the Egyptians were not ruling Egypt. The Hiskos were ruling Egypt. H-Y-S-K-O-S. Or I got to look that up so I don't give you the wrong information. But they were Semitic cousins of the Israelites. So, you know. All right, it's H-Y-S-K-O-S. -S. And they were ruling in Egypt at the time. They were Semitic cousins of the Israelites, according to my best history that I've read. But they want, you know, they want you to think that uh, Joseph's children were half Egyptian. No, they weren't. Sorry, Charlie. But only the best tuna gets to be star kissed. Yeah. Um, hence, the Abrahamic origin of the Anglo-Saxons has not been disproved when its op opponents assert that we do not possess crooked noses. But we assert that if they had the same show of countenance that is peculiar to the Jewish people, they could not be the house of Joseph. But we Saxons get our straight noses from our royal ancestor that presided in Egypt. We say royal ancestor because Joseph married uh, A-S-E-N-A-T-H, Asenath, the daughter of Potiphera, Prince of On, instead of a priest of On. As you may see by consulting the original reading of Genesis 41-45, whereas the Saxon has neither a decided um, nose or its pronounced opposite, the Egyptian acute angle, but he has an exquisite uh, blend, which is much more handsome. It has been made clear to our readers that Amri, the sixth king of Israel, built the city of Samaria, the third and permanent capital of Israel, and that eventually the entirely uh, the entire country formerly called All Israel became known as Samaria because that was the name of its capital. Also that Samaria had become one of the national names of Israel and is so used in some prophecies concerning them. Hence, Amri is regarded as the real founder of the kingdom of Samaria and Samaria and Israel was often referred to by other nations as the house of Amri. When Shalmaneser, the king of Assyria, who led Israel into captivity, made a record of that captivity, on the table uh, tablets of Assyria, he called them the house of Amri. Also, when Israel was confederate with Rezin, king of Syria, and went against the Jews, and the Jews besought Tiglath Pilasar, who was at the time king of Assyria, to become their confederate, he also in his records referred to Israel as the um, house of Amri. In the annals of Sargon, who was also a king of Assyria, Isaiah 20 and verse 1, successor of 
Shalmaneser and predecessor of Sennacherib, Israel is called Beth Qumri, House of Amri, and their capital city, Qumri, on the Nimrod obelisk, Jehu, the son of Amri, is written, Yahuwah Abil Qumri. I'm probably not pronouncing that right, but you get the idea. Professor Rawlinson, who does not believe this truth we are enforcing, says, Jehu is usually called in the Bible the son of Nimshi, although Jehoshaphat says Jehoshaphat was his actual father. 2 Kings 9 and verse 20. But the Assyrians taking him for the legitimate successor to the throne, named as his father, or royal ancestor, Omri, the founder of the kingdom of Samaria. Omri's name being written on the obelisk, as it is in the inscriptions of Shalmaneser, where the kingdom of Israel is always called the country of Amri. Um, Amri. Dr. Hinks also says the title son of Omri is, is equivalent to that of king of Samaria, the city which Omri built and which was known to the Assyrians as Beth Omri or Qumri. The tribes of both Dan and Simeon belonged, of course, to the uh, Amri when used as meaning the kingdom of Amri or Samaria. Simeon seems to have clung to this name far more tenaciously than did Dan. For they still call themselves in their country Kimri. The name Kimri or Simri, C-Y-M-R-Y, or with a K-Y-M-R-I, as it is more commonly written, is in reality the plural of K-Y-M-R-O, meaning a Welsh man, and the country of the Kimri is called by themselves Kimru, which has been Latinized into the well-known name of Cambria. The letter V in the Welsh language has two powers, and both these powers are active in the word uh, K-Y-M-R-Y. This letter V sounds as U, except when it stands in the last syllable of a word, and then it has the sound of the Italian I or the English EE. -E. Hence the Crete pronunciation of the country of Wales or land of the Simri in its ancient tongue would be as near as possible to the name Cumri or Cumri or Cumri. Thomas Stevens in the preface of his literature of the Cumri says, on the map of Britain facing St. George's Channel is a group of counties called Wales inhabited by a people distinct from, but not very imperfectly understood by, those who surround them. Their neighbors call them Welshmen. Welsh or Walsh is not a proper name, but a Teutonic term signifying strangers, and was applied to all persons who were not of that family. But the proper name of these people is K-Y-M-R-Y. -Y. These are the last remnant of the K-I-M-M-E-R-I-O-I -I of Homer and that of the Kimri, C-I-M-B-R-I, of Germany. Hence the Simbric, uh, C-H-E-R-S-O-N-E-S-U-S, -E Jutland. A portion of these lands on the shores of North Cumberland, gave their name to the country of Cumberland. Cumberland, oh, okay. And in the process of time following the seaside to have their present resting place where they still call themselves Kimri and give the country a similar name. Their history, clear, concise, and authentic, ascends to a high antiquity. Their language was in bodied in verse long before the languages now spoken rose into notice and their literature cultivated and abundant lays claim to being the most ancient in modern europe ah the most ancient language of modern uh in modern europe 
Thus we find that the Cumri, Cumri, Kimri, Cumbrae, Cimbri, or Cambrians, as the name is variously called in ver different tongues, were strangers and wanderers, wanderers among the nations until they settled in the Isles of the Sea with the rest of their brethren, the British or Covenant people. Herodotus, H-E-R-O-D-O-T-U-S, the father of history, tells us much about the uh, Cumbri, a people who in his day dwelt in the Crimean Peninsula and thereabout. He particularly notes that they had come into that ter territory from Media, of which he remarks was not their original home or birthplace our race uh, Bob's note here if you don't know what where media is uh, the Medes and the Persians read the book of Daniel the last chapters or two um, the Medes and the Persians came and conquered Babylon and allowed Israel well Judah and what was left of Israel to return to the land so not everybody went to Jerusalem. They spread out. Uh, think about it. Would you want to go to a Jerusalem when it was burned and destroyed? You know? Or would you rather go somewhere else? I don't know. Especially if... I don't know. Let's keep reading. We have thus conclusively followed the word Cymru, for the reason that the people are known as Angles, Saxons, Danes, Celts, or Celts, Jutes, Scots, Welsh, Siths, or Scythians, or Normans, can trace themselves back to Media, Persia, but no further, and find that their ancestors in the Cymru at the place, and at the very time, when Israel was losing her identity and was actually known in the history of that country as the Beth Qumri, the house of Qumri, or house of Omri. We cannot take time or space to deal with the origin of all the above names, but we feel that we must say something concerning the name Saxon, as it is the most general name of the race, really the present generic name for the house of Joseph. It seems to be a well-known Hebraism, and for some reason it is certainly was a very common custom among the Israelites to drop the first letter of a proper name. Bible examples of this customs are Oshia, otherwise Hosea, Hagar, otherwise Agar, Jacob, otherwise known uh, Achan, Heber, otherwise Eber, scholars tell us that if we have caught their thought that this Hebrew idiom is particular to this possessive case and also to allow the introduction of an af affix, when Jacob transferred the birthright to the sons of Joseph, he, with one hand resting on the head of each, prayed, let my name Israel be named on them and the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac. The birthright kingdom did, as we have seen, inherit the name of Israel and also that of Isaac. For Amos says, And the high places of Isaac shall be desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel, Bethel and Dan, shall be laid waste, and I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Amos 7 and 9. Here we have Isaac, Israel, and the house of Jeroboam used as interchangeable names for the ten tribe kingdom. Amaziah also says to Jeroboam, the king of Isaac, Israel, The Lord said unto me, Go, prophesy unto my people Israel. Now therefore hear thou the word of the Lord. Thou sayest, prophesy not against Israel, and drop not thy word against the house of Isaac. Amos 7 and verse 16. 
Thus the name of Isaac was named upon the house of Joseph, and it is true both in race and name that in Isaac, in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Bob's note here. Remember, who was the firstborn of Abraham? Ishmael. He was the son of uh, Abraham via Hagar, the Egyptian woman. But God said, nope, he's not going to be the heir. God blessed him, but he's not going to be the heir. But, you know, Sarah would conceive. 90-year-old woman had a baby. I think she was 90. She was old. So, in Isaac shall I see be called. It seems that the Jews had a preference for the name of Jacob, but Israel clung to the name of Isaac, especially after they were taken into captivity. They dropped the name of Israel and called themselves Sac, or Sacae, S-A-C-A-E, or Saxe, S-A-X-A-E, as per Latin Derivi deriv derivation, D-E-R-I-V-A-T-I-O-N, which is nothing more or less than the Hebrew name for Isaac, from which the initial letter I has been dropped. It is a well-documented, uh, well-authenticated fact that the word Saxon is derived from the Hebrew name of Isaac, Isaac Saxon, together with an F, F, affix, which means sons of. So Saxon means sons of Isaac. Professor Totten says in most of the Eastern languages, sons of is written Sumnia. It is the equivalent of the Scottish Mac and the English and Irish Fitz Mac Donald, son of Donald, Fitz Henry, son of Henry. So is the distant home of our ancestors, Saxonii, means sons of Isaac. Stambul is formed of Istanbul by dropping the prefix I, and so the Saxon is a direct descendant of our father Isaac. Dr. W. Holt Yates accepts this deriv derivation of the Saxon name as positive, and the Reverend W. H. Poole, Doctor of Divinity, speaks of it as follows. It is a little curious to glean from the ancient nations and from the stone monuments of the early times the various forms of which this word is to be found. I will here insert a few from a list of my own glean from ancient history. Thus, sons of Isaac, sons of Sac, Saxunii, Saxuna, Saxena, Saca, Pena, Isaac, Ska, Sakai, uh, forget it. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Saxons, Saxonia, Saxon, Saxony, yeah, our race. Concerning the etymology of the word Saxon, Yatman says, its history is as follows. The Persians used the name Sakai and Scythian, Scythian, S-C-Y-T-H-I-N, as convertible, whether from a corrupt rendering of one of the other or become or because the Sakai, the great tribe of Scythians, wanderers, bordering upon them, were so called by a tribal name. Of the fact of the identity of the Sakai and the Scythians, there is not the shadow of a doubt that is clear that these people called their country Sakisima. It is equally clear that the Saxons of England were the Scyth Scythians or Celt Scythians. Their geological position in Europe is accurately described as uh, by Plutarch Taxius, T A C I T U S, Ptolemy, and other authors. To this testimony, all the historians agree. Strabo asserts that the most ancient Greek historians knew the Sakai as a people who lived beyond the Caspian Sea. 
Diodorus says the Sakai sprung from a people in Medea who obtained a vast and glorious empire. Ptolemy finds the Saxons in a race of Scythians called Sakai who came from Media. Bob's note here. If you don't know who Ptolemy is, he was a Greek Macedonian who was one of the generals of Alexander the Great, who was in charge of Egypt um, prior to the time of Christ. Like, I'm not exactly sure of the timetable, but uh, from what I understand, he had a daughter. Perhaps you've heard of her. Her name was Cleopatra. Yeah. Pliny says the Sakai were among the most distinguished people of Scythia who settled in Armenia, Armenia and were called Sakai Sinai. Albinus says the Saxons were descended from the ancient Sakai of Asia. Prido, P R I D E A U X, finds that the Cimbrians came from between the Black Sea and Caspian Seas, and that with them came the Angli. Sharon Turner, boy, I'll tell you what, Bob's note here, Sharon Turner wrote a big, huge thing on the Anglo, the origins of the Anglo-Saxon race. If memory serves me correctly, he was a an attorney. So Sharon Turner, the great Saxon historian, says, the Saxons were a Scythian nation and were called Saka, Sakai, Saki, and Sachsen. Gowler, G-A-W-L-E-R, he did another. Uh, he, you should. He did another book. I don't remember what it is, but uh, he, I, I mentioned him in a previous study. Gowler in our Scythian ancestors, page six says. The word Sakai, S-A-A-C-A-E, -A -E, is fairly without straining or imagination translatable as Isaacites, Isaacites. But why has it been necessary for the historians of these various nations thus to trace this name, search records, ta ta tablets and monuments, and hunt for the origin of the Anglo-Saxons. Are they an obscure people? Are they a feeble nation? Are they an ignorant folk? Are they an uncivilized race? No, they are diametrically opposite to all this. They are in every way the greatest race on earth. Hmm. But they do not know where they originated, no nor do they know who their ancestors were. They are lost. Bob's note here. How come every race in the world, whether they be black, brown, yellow, whatever, all want to come to white nations? Why is that? Don't you have white people wanting to go to China or Japan or India or Haiti? Or Africa or Mexico no well they you know if they're living on Social Security they might go to a third world country but generally they all want to come to United States Canada Europe um, you know then they, they come here and tell us how bad we are hmm all right let's keep reading some of these historians whom we have quoted do not agree among themselves as to the origin of the Saxons, but belongs to different schools of contention and are wrangling over the question whether these lost people belong to the Aryan or to the Semitic race. The only use which we have just here for their contention is to show that they all trace the Saxons to the very place where the captive 10 tribes of Israel were deported by Shalmaneser, the king of Assyria. These same historians also show that the Saxons sprang into existence insofar as their modern and medieval history is concerned 
about three years after the Israelites were taken into that country and that there they lose them and can trace them no further. Since both the Saxons and Samaritan Israelites are lost, and since those Israelites are the sons of Isaac and were so called in sacred history, and since both people bear the name of their father, Isaac, we have no hesitancy in saying that they are one and the same and that the lost are found. And since these people have been told that they are not the chosen people of God, we together with many others now declare unto them that they are the natural children of Abraham, the national sons of God. It is a most significant fact that Leah fail the name of the Bethel stone in the same, whether read from right to left uh, as the Hebrews do, or whether it is read from left to right as the Saxons do. Also the word has just seven letters, the perfect number, and if we start with the fourth, the human number, or central letter, we read from that either to the right or to the left, we have in both instances the same word, i.e. F-A-I-L, in which we use the PH for the F sound, we have that Hebrew word, wonderful. Wonderful, which is one of the names of the Messiah, or the Christ. Or if we start either with the left or right, read to the central letter, and then back again to the place from which it started, Leah fail, then we have the full name of Leah fail. In a former chapter, when quoting from Irish Chronicles concerning Leah fail, we showed that the one form of the word, or one of its names, was written L-E-A-G-A-E-L. This word has the same peculiarities as that of Leah fail in that it also has seven letters and that when it is read either from left to right or from right to left, it is the same word whereby beginning either to the right or the left and reading to the central letter and back again, we still have L-E-A-G-A-E-L. And by beginning with the fourth or central letter and reading either from left to right as the Saxons do or from right to left as the Hebrews do, we have in each case the same word, i.e. G-A-E-L, Gael. This word Gael is a Hebrew word and yet it is absolutely one of the most important words in all the history of the Saxon people for it is the name of that tongue, speech, or dialect, which is the very root of the King's English. As that language is sometimes called, which is now known as the mother tongue of the Saxons, but which evidently is not the original language of that race, for it is only several hundred years old. And these historians from whom we have quoted trace them back along the line of history for 2,520 years. The fact of this change in the language of the Saxons as the years have been rolling by dovetails into the history of Ephraim Israel as foretold by the prophet Isaiah who in the first verse of the 28th chapter says woe to the crown of pride to the drunkards of Ephraim remember we are not dealing with a race of saints but with a people who have largely gone away from their God although to begin with they were a people who were wholly a right seed all right so nationally speaking while other nations are opium eaters and have other vices which cling to them as a people the saxons are the drunkard nations of the earth great britain and drunkenness is worse than america but america is bad enough in this respect to be so recognized by the more temperate nations of the world. Bob's note here. Germany has a, an entire festival about uh, beer. It's called Oktoberfest. Uh, I know, because I was there. Uh, but our chief object in giving this quotation is to show that the prophet was addressing Ephraim, of whom he further says, 
For with stammering lips and another tongue will he, the Lord, speak to this people. The Hebrew word which is in this text is translated stammering is that word G-A-E-L. It is a remarkable fact that Young, in his analytical concordance, gives us the word L-A-E-G as the original Hebrew word, while Strong's, in his exhaustive concordance, gives us the equally correct word G-A-E-L from the same Hebrew word. But be it L-E-A-G or the Hebrew or G-A-E-L to the Saxon, it is the same word to the same people, which they have reversed and given to their newer language, which is called the Gael or Gaelic, Gaelic language, which is not only the fountain of the English language, but is yet spoken in its primitive simplicity in many places in Wales, Scotland, and the north of Ireland. Wales is only another form of G-A-E-L-S, Gales, and the people whose language are called Gales were themselves often called Gales. Bob's note here. Um, do you know what they used to call France? Gaul. Gale, Gaul. I don't know. At first, when a person needed to speak of uh, but one of these people, the custom was to say one G-A-E-L, but the language changed the form of one to and before a vowel sound and to a before a consonant sound. Thus, one gall became angel, A-N-G-A-E-L, and hence the Hebrew word ish means man. We can understand how things would get a little mixed and how easy it would be the evolution from angel Englishman. Englishman? Englishman? Hmm. Also, since these same people were called Angli and Saxel, Saxes, the combination and evolution of these names in Anglo Saxon would be inevitable. And that is the end, page 299. Um, I hope you are enjoying this series. I don't even remember a lot of this material. Uh, it has been so long since I'd read this uh, book, you know, 30 years ago. Some people say, Bob, your brain's like a computer sometimes. Other times it's, uh, I think Alzheimer's is setting in, but, you know, what can I tell you? So, all blessings Blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' name. Amen.